tell me my love when you've been to the brink and I've taken the edge off my thirst when I'm falling from grace in the eye of the storm with the pain of remorse at its worst So we're here today in Fire Station Creative with the legendary Stevie Agnew. Stevie, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to a good blather. No, we've been talking about getting you on for ages, Stevie, so thanks for coming <laughs> in. I know it's absolutely freezing outside just now and uh, the roads are treacherous, so I appreciate you making the effort to come here. Oh, no bother. So uh, I want to talk about the, the first time I ever heard about you and it was my dad came in from the pub and he was raving about this amazing singer that he had heard uh, performing uh, somewhere in, in this area and uh, he got me so whipped up about it I was I was so excited to to uh, finally meet you uh, but that was a long time ago I remember I can actually remember meeting you the first time and it was uh, I think when Bob used to come about well it was I think it was probably maybe Tap of Duties or something like that was playing at the time. Yeah. I think it the Monday nights and somewhere in the tune anyway. But uh, and I remember he told me about yourself, but do you know the art and that? And then he showed me the, and it was all the scary stuff you were doing at that time. <laughs> I'm still doing it. You know, <laughs> it was like this kind of scary. Uh, so I was a wee bit frightened of you, but at the same time I thought it was really cool. <laughs> and then we, 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 I think we got a few beers and then we decided to call you Crazy Horse and that was your, your stock is the name, eh? The Lord that, Crazy that, Horse. That's my nickname. It's good. <laughs> but aye, no, your dad loved all the same music as me. I mean, he loved all the Frankie Miller and when I'd meet him in the old inn, mm. it was always the old inn and we would sit and, and it was always, a, well, I liked to get drink back then. Yeah. <laughs> we used to always meet up and... Well, well, uh, well my father, he was a, a, an American uh, music fanatic. I mean, he loved Americana and he loved uh, particularly country music. And Aye. I think that's where you two probably had a oh, lot to talk really about. Oh, I really had to offer you a chat away about all loved all the same stuff as me, all yeah. the same music and that, you know. So so tell me, how how you got started with music, Stevie? Well, I mean, uh, it was always in the family, obviously. My, my dad uh, being, you know, one of with the Nazareth, one of the big Dunfermline bands, you know. Yeah. Uh, and obviously music was always in the, in the house, but... Mm. Um, but I mean, I was always like, my f I loved like the rock and roll. It was like my mum, actually, to be honest, she was like, she loved Elvis. Mm -hmm. And that was my first sort of thing where I just wanted to be Elvis. You right. know what I mean? So it was, uh, I went, you go through the different stages, but um, I was always, it was all Buddy Holly, Elvis, Little Richard, all mm -hmm. the rock and roll stuff. And then, you know, over time, you know, you get, but we had a band going, but over time it was all different. Went through all the different stages, the mm -hmm. heavy metal stage with the long hair and the back patches and the, all the different things. Eh? Yeah. But um, we done our first recording was actually there was a guy Pano and mm -hmm. he was actually he was the the original the first he was the Skids f manager oh, right. original yeah Pano Pano I right? Pano right. I only know him as Pano but he had a studio above. Where the Chinese restaurant is in Bruce Street, you know, at the top, there used to be the boxing club. There's a Chinese restaurant still there. Or the, the, yeah. Was and uh, if I could mind the name, I'd plug them so I could maybe get free Chinese food for that. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. I can't remember either. Yeah. <laughs> but I know exactly but, the it's Chinese ticket you're like, talking about. Right. I'm going to drop yeah. that in later. Yeah. But um, no, and we done our first recording up there. It was um, me, my brother Chris. No, my brother Lee plays the drums. He actually plays drums with my dad now. Yeah. But um, we're only about... That must have been 10 or 11. But up there, the, the studio was called Slippy Gloop. Mm -hmm. And the whole place was painted black. like, And there was pink slop like that on everything. Right. And, like, and Pano was just covered in it. He was just wearing black stuff with like pink slop. And, uh, but he had the band Slippy Gloop with James Ward in that, which is now... Thy Hobos. Oh, I know, well, it's not yeah. now Thy Hobos, but that's what James is doing now, eh? Yeah. But that was our first recording up there. But And how old were you when you were doing that? I'd be about 10. The first gig, right. would, I'd be 10 or 11, because I think the first gig we'd done, I was 9 or 10, it was Crossford Gala. Mm. But we played Crossford Gala, it was like the entertainment day. Mm -hmm. I don't know what year it was, but there were a lassie 
and Jean Davis, and she it was like, I wasn't a talent competition, but it was like just all folk playing. Mm -hmm. And she played the E.T. theme tune that had just come out, so she'd done it on right. the piano, so that's right. what year, it must have been 1983 or something. Right. We played there, and then it rained on Galladay, so we ended up playing in the big barn, played Galladay, and the next gig we done was the Canega Hall. Right. And it was a Highland show thing, and we just came on. And but were, you, it was were you singing? I was singing, but right. it was funny with the band, but I used to talk an American accent, and yeah. that, you know. And even I was at the school, I used to tell everybody I was from America. <laughs> I mean, my big brother coming down for the play, the thing coming down and saying, stop telling everybody you're American. Because mm -hmm. I was like, howdy, and I still walk like John Wayne now. <laughs> eh? and, uh, but when we were at the Canega Hall, I had a recording for years at somewhere on a tape. And I'm talking to them, going, I'm, I'm talking, <laughs> talking away to the audience in an American accent. Going, I'd like to thank you all for coming along and everyone about nine year old. Have eh? you still got the tape? And I have got the tape somewhere. I have got it somewhere. I was always wanting to get the tape, so I put on the, you know, yeah. CDs or something one day. Yeah, maybe, on, you can, CDs maybe you can record it with your phone and send it to me and we'll put it on the podcast. Aye, so. I'd need to, I'd, if you could get a hold of a tape machine, I've definitely got the tape. Hmm. If we could get a hold of a tape machine, we'll that would it, be yeah. funny. I so, can do that. I'll see if I can do that. I mean, whenever I think of you, I always think of your deep voice. And um, what was your voice like when you were ten? Well, I always had a kind of, for my age. I, I, well, I, I quite. It was always quite gravelly. Mm. It was always gravelly. But I remember, like, when my voice broke, and it was weird because, like, you know, I could always sing. No, like, in and I heard, I could just sing no problem way up high in that when I was young because mm -hmm. you no know, never ending range in that. You know. Yeah. When you sort of, you know, reach puberty and that, you know, and it was like, uh, I couldn't do that as much. And I remember it affected me a bit because, you know, we were that wee and we were playing and everybody tells you you're brilliant because you're wee and cute and mm -hmm. everything else. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, you just get treated, sort of, folks stop telling you, <laughs> you know, we're turning up for gigs or what, but it went on a bit, I sort of lost my confidence a bit when I was about 16 or you something. You treat like a man now. I, I, all, all of a sudden it was like the one that going, that was kind of better than Paul McCartney or whatever, didn't they say to you anymore? <laughs> post puberty, you've got to earn your stripes. Ah, yeah. Yeah. But and then I kind of go back into it, like, no long actually. I was, I was playing full time by the time I was 19 anyway. Mm. I sort of go into it. Then. So, as your your artistic development took hold, who was it influencing you in your teenage years? Well, I mean, there was, there, I had a, a, a eclectic taste, I think, because I had all my dad's vinyl. So we had like all the like, really cool stuff like Otis Redden, the Alex Harvey band, the band, uh, obviously Nazareth for me was, you know, uh, probably the biggest fan, like, you know mm. what I mean? It's, um, Frankie Miller, um, you, you, like that. that you, would, you met Frankie Miller. I met Frankie that? Miller, aye. Do you, want, do you want to tell me that story? <laughs> That's an interesting story, yeah. that one. Well, I'll tell you, I've never actually told the thing. I mean, uh, no, what actually happened was, because um, he was quite, well, you like, liked to drink in that, and eh? I mm -hmm. think he was quite sort of rough and ready, sort of like, you know, like he didn't, eh? I don't think he liked the fame thing, eh? Mm -hmm. But, I think he just, to get, I'll be fair to him, he probably was a bit embarrassed at the time, but I was only just, I, I don't, I, think I would be young anyway, but 11 or 12 or something like that. Mm -hmm. but he was my hero, total hero, eh? Yeah. And uh, we went to this gig, it was, Naz was playing Frankie Miller, a band called Wasted, which was UFO at the time and that. And it was a festival, mm -hmm. I can't, I'm trying to remember where it was, but uh, anyway. It was what happened was I got to stand at the side of the stage and watch Frankie Miller and he came on and he sang and I'm amazing and just before they had a wet t-shirt competition which was the first time I'd seen anything like that as well. Nice. Was, <laughs> that was, I wanted to get involved in rock and roll after that. Like, I don't blame you, hey. This is all right, this is better than painting and decorating. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, but um, when I come off, when he come off, he went to his caravan and I had a funny feeling because I went to get his autograph and he was standing talking to two sort of probably a bit older, right? Mm. And then first of all, my brother went up and then um, his mate, Stuart, and they asked him for his autograph. You could see he was a bit, and he kind of scribbled it and gave him it. But when I come up, mm -hmm. uh, it was like, I said, can I get your autograph too? And he just went, would you want my girl for? He said, I wouldn't credit your mommy, right? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I was devastated. I was so embarrassed there. I went away 
and uh, can I'm sitting greeting at the side of the station and mm. then my dad come past mm-hmm. and uh, it was like he come past what's wrong oh Frankie Miller told me so I don't know what he said to him but he went away to see him the next minute he came back and uh, you know it was all got a photo of him that was a kind of lager and there was ones with the, the women oh, you know, right, the yeah. one that she's in the, 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 the he actually was my lager. first lager ironically <laughs> my first lager of a Frankie Miller that's not bad so I was standing drinking yeah. it but it was obviously sort of written, you know, whatever. Right. But then my grand's at the background going, Who told her, Stevie? And my dad's <laughs> trying to, like, you know, <laughs> my granny Rosie, she's going daft. But funnily enough, so that happened anyway. And then I got his autograph in that, right? Mm-hmm. But years later, after he had, you know, because he had like the, it was like a brain hemorrhage. Yeah. And he's never obviously been, the, you know, the same as a sin because, I mean, it was a sin for anybody, but he had the greatest voice I'd ever yeah. known. And he, you know, can't really speak mm. of that. Now, Yours really. is better. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, um, it's too kind. But in what um, what happened was when they had a, a gig for him years later. I mean, we were twenty years later, and it was it was basically by this time it was to raise funds for his charity, that charity, or you know, that he'd obviously was what do you you know call it when you're sponsoring a charity or something. So yeah, yeah, it was, he was, the, he was the patron for the charity. Patron for the charity. Yeah, yeah. So it was this great big gig and it was in the Barrowlands. And I'd just heard about it. And I knew that Dad, because of all Scottish bands and stuff, so right. Billy Connolly, was, he sang on the album Proclaimers, Nazareth, Alex Harvey, Ray Wilson, a lot, a lot of different folk. But they were all to send in a version of a Frankie Miller song. And uh, so I... I just, I, I had the idea in my head, I just thought, right. So I went through all my mum's old photos and I found the photo. Mm-hmm. And there's a great song called I'll Never Be That Young Again, which is, and funnily enough, nobody had chose to cover that song. And with me being away when that had happened, and I found the photo and we standing with the lager, and I sent the CD with the photo and me to, sent it off to the, the, the thing. And I loved it. And his girlfriend, or his wife now, his girlfriend, she got back in touch and he was he loved it. And then it, he actually put us on the album and he asked for the photograph and I actually sent him the original photograph. And then at the night of the gig, we were, I was playing in the Barrowlands and uh, he actually put us on the big stage right. where, 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 the, where the stars. Yeah. And as legend has it, I mean, I've been told this by a few folk, Ronnie Lessos told me, Ronnie Dorumpel told me, so it must be. I mean, I believe it, but apparently when I got up to do that song, he stood up at his wheelchair and Is that right? stood like that during the song. And obviously it came, but more than one person told me that, eh? So it was a big thing. And then at the end of the night, I was standing and he didn't want to get on the stage because I think, you know, he was, maybe because he was in the thing and... Yeah. They were up singing. Every, all the people that had played were up singing Caledonia, and I thought, I'm not going to get up because I'm not actually famous. Mm-hmm. So I was standing at the side of the stage, and everyone's mm-hmm. shouting for Frankie, and I'm watching this Caledonia, and he just appeared beside me. Mm-hmm. And it was just the two of us stood and watched it. It was surreal. Oh, yeah. And he had a can of beer. No, I had a can of beer. Yeah. And it was a tenants, and I went like that. This is, and he went like that and shook the can, and, went, and he drank it, and then Darwin came on, and kind of went away. But it was just such a... It's quite a mad story eh, when you think about how you know. It's a, it's a magic moment for ah, you, isn't it? But I mean, it was, I was um, playing, knowing that I was when I went on, knowing that Frankie Miller was in the audience watching me sing. It was probably the highlight of my the, ever career. The, you know the, what I mean? I've never seen you, you know, looking remotely shy on stage or anything like that. But did you feel intimidated knowing that your heroes are in the no, audience? No, I mean, I'd had a good few tins in that, so I was like, <laughs> but, but I was, yeah, uh, after that first one that Frankie gave me all the years ago, yeah. got rid of my shyness, but, no, but, uh, no, I, I, uh, I didn't really get, well, I suppose I would be a bit, I don't get nervous when I'm playing the, like my pub gigs, the only thing I get nervous about with that is just, you know, make, make sure you're in, the sound's all right and things yeah. like that. Once I'm up playing, I'm usually all right. I don't like talking much, you know, like, I'm all right, you know, in the audience, you know, I've, I find it quite hard to... You prefer just to... I prefer just to play. Sing, yeah. It's, uh, but you've got complete confidence in your, your singing ability and your... Well, I sing away anymore, yeah. but, if you, but it's, I'm getting better with the talking than I used to be, but even if somebody was to say, like, can you do the bit where you call folk up for the first dance? And I used to hate it. I used to get, like, Dave to do it. And, mm. that. and yeah. I said, can you know Dave? He says, right, but it looks a bit stupid that you're not saying it, but yeah. I don't know what it is. 
it's just it's a different thing. It's a different kind of confidence. When I'm doing that, but I feel all right. It's maybe as well though when you're playing in, especially on the tune, you know everybody. Eh? So it's mm. like kind of you don't really, you know, you don't know what to, you get up and go. All right, folks, and you know they know you, so it's like your pals. It so, sounds fake or something. Ah, like, yeah. Sometimes, as again, when you've got a couple of pints, you can do it a bit easier Once, than yeah. when you're just. Uh, I know that feeling. Mm, like, so, you know. Well, I mean, your your talent speaks for itself, though, because every time we book you here, you know, we can guarantee the place will be rammed. You know, you're you're it's always busy here when you perform. So I think I think that speaks to your 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 natural ah, well, was, ability as a performer. Well, well. It's a good, it's a great wee gig. This one is. It's, uh, I like it because it's chilled out and that as well. It's yeah. nice to do ones like you know. It's a smaller venue, it's isn't it? Yeah. Focus certain and you can do. It's quite good for like. You could even do maybe do an original song, or you could do some ballads now, just because it's got that kind of thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, all the places are different for good for different things, eh? Yeah. But no, it's good in here. It's but aye, it's been a good, for the great, uh, a great, a great run in here, a great turnout. Yeah, it's been great. So. Know. I mean, we've just focused on your your inspiration and your your performances, but I mean, you also write music as well. And I know that that your first album was uh, Wrecking Yard, yeah. um, and I remember when that first came out, and it was it was met with with great acclaim. So tell uh, me tell me a bit about Wrecking Yard, and then we'll, we'll talk about your second album after. Well, that. I mean, it, it came about really. It was funny because there was no plans at that point. I did a kind of was I, I don't know. I I'd kind of. I hadn't thought about doing anything like that for a long time, and then at this particular time, our friend Chris Smith joined uh, as a drummer, as yeah. a drummer for the band, for a, an original band that we had, but it was different stuff. That, that was, it was another, we'd been writing stuff, but we hadn't done an album or anything. Yeah. And then just as time went on, he was uh, great at lyrics, really mm. good at lyrics, and, and it, you know, he's very... He was one of the folk that can work everything, you know, like computers and recording stuff, and yeah. just quite organised. And mm. just so I needed it was quite good, very, some, something like that. That's it was it was very technical, technical, yeah. very technical, and also he could, you know, he was very artistic in, yeah, that, in like yeah. different ways. The, the lyrics on that so album were fantastic, fan, yeah. lyrics, and that was the thing because it was like, uh I was never a lyricist. I could mm -hmm. write a tune, yeah. You know what I mean? But I was never. I, I was just. Anytime I try to write something, it would just turn it like a Bon Jovi song or something, you know what I mean? There's yeah. just some folk have got that skill to to put into the words what the, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a separate skill. Some folk yeah. have got it all, you know, mm. Springsteen or Bob Dylan. Well, Bob Dylan's not really a singer, but I mean, you know, but, mm. but something like Springsteen, you know, they can play and they can write, it's like the full. But when I had Chris on board, we, I remember it was, he just asked me, I can mind at the time, it was like, what's your favourite Albums like what would you just like to do? And I think the reason it went so well was we we didn't try to do anything commercial of that because my favourite album at the time, was, well, one of my favourite albums still is uh, the Ghost of Tom George, which is a Springsteen album, mm -hmm. but it's an acoustic album. Mm. But it's brilliant, but it's not like commercial in any way. And I didn't actually, you know, I said, well, I love that album. Mm. So we kind of looked at that kind of style and we studied it, and I mean, we took it from. That I mean, there was all originally there was some things were a bit close to the bone, you know, to that, and yeah. then you kind of and but then from doing that we managed to get other songs and that so it was it was that American thing and obviously we we figured we'll go for the America totally go for America we were hoping well the plan you know go for America and try and get because it's always been quite a big thing the American in the country yeah over there but it, it did get really I mean. You know, it wasn't a ground world breaking, but I mean, we got some really good, uh, from some quite great reviews. There was a, a magazine, No Depression, and that's a quite a big Americana magazine. They gave a great write up. Yeah. And it was on my birthday that it came out first of May. I was like, it was brought was like a great present. But then even over here, I mean, we folk. I was surprised folk took to, you know, like just like just around Scotland and stuff, you know. You're surprised it was a fantastic uh, album. Why, well, would, why was, wouldn't he? It was, well, it was, I mean, I, I, I got really well received, and uh, we had a great, uh, again, at the Carnegie Hall, we'd, we'd done a, a great, it was like the album launch thing, and yeah. it's handy now with all your social media. It's good for some things, that social media. It was good for yeah, promotion, you know, punting the album and yeah, that, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Sure is. So that, I mean, it really, it was probably all that kind of thing that got the audience, you know, because we, we got a full house that night, and then, 
Uh, we done another album after that. I, we spent a, well, another couple of years. I think we spent recording another one, which was it was actually called Bad Blood and Whiskey the album, but it was Steve Agnew and Hurricane Road because right. it was kind of like that, you know, Bruce Springs and the East Street Band. Yes, yeah, I. So and it was nice to have an actual band because the first album it was great, but we just had people like you know like uh, session musicians really just hired folk in mm. whereas the second one it was still me and Chris the Roy of the songs but yeah. we had an actual band uh, and I mean uh, and, and that one uh, you know again we just the same thing you know we've done yeah. a done the album um, you know this, it went through the same lines and then we've done another launch and stuff so I mean it was good I mean it was I mean it's it's sort of uh, we never really done much after that. We I mean, just kind of parted ways. Well, I just kind of come to the natural end, really, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. But, uh, but it was fun. It was, I mean, for me, it was brilliant to, from my point of view, it was amazing to, because the lyrics are that good, in my opinion, it, and they're powerful. Like, he wrote a lot of songs about, there was one called, uh, I, I forget the names now, but they were powerful songs. There was, mm-hmm. like, one about sort of war and stuff and, you know, it was really kind of was like singing stuff that's meaningful. Yeah. Again, rather than singing, I, I always like even when I, I let, I much prefer singing songs that are that mean something. Kind mm. of, I mean, lyrics are important to me. Yeah. Uh, so I, it was, it was, it was a great, it was a blessing getting yeah, to but, do all that, but, and then folk hearing you doing your own material and in an actual studio with your voice in a studio yeah. and. I really got into it at the time. It was. It's, uh, it's a funny thing you listen experience. to. Listen to a country artist. You know they they might have a huge profile, but the the lyrics are dreadful and they're just they're really corny. Some you know. things are just absent. Some things, I mean, a lot of bands. Don't get me wrong. As I say, I'm not a lyricist, but some of the things you hear that, that, when you actually, there's no sense at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's funny, but, but and there are obviously there's when you're out in the pubs and that there's classic, you know, songs and you do them and there's sing-alongs and everything else, but then there's maybe. But I much prefer the ones that's got a bit of meaning bit yeah. of something about it, you yeah. know. I'm, well, I know that you like uh, Bruce Springsteen, oh. and, and I, I personally love uh, Bob Dylan as well. Oh, Dylan, and, I'm a huge fan of Dylan yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, the lyrics are just so rich, uh, and you know, it's, it's like you're taken to a different land through, oh. the, through, through the lyrics alone aye. as well as the music. But I, so um, I was a wee bit disappointed today when. You told me that you hadn't brought Elvis's guitar. I know, t- I know, t- I know, I know. I meant to. T- I just, I, I, I was just, I, I just, uh, I brought my stunt guitar. It's probably st- safer leaving okay. that one in the house. So, like, but you know. So, so, so tell me how you came to be the proprietor of one of uh, Elvis Presley's oh, guitars. Elvis Presley's guitar. Well, it's uh, what was. It? I mean, it's what. Well, I like to think. You know, I still say it's <laughs> Elvis Presley's guitar. I've got a. Uh, I know I've got Willie Nelson's hat that I got from uh, from you from your from your father, yeah. which was kindly gifted to me. And that's that's uh, that's up on the wall, and I've got a couple of photos of Dad with Chuck Berry, mm. which is there, which is great. The black and white ones, because uh, that's what when Chuck Berry used to go anywhere, he just he expected a band to be there. Mm. So Dad and Daryl Sweet were uh, they were just in wherever. It was in America at the yeah. time. Incredible. You know, they're on a the stage with Chuck Berry. I have to yeah. look at it. I've got a dad standing with Chuck Berry. I just mm. think. But then the next part of the wall is Elvis Presley's guitar. But what it was is dad got it and it was in Memphis, mm-hmm. Tennessee and that. And I think Graceland was up the road and stuff and there was a sweet music shop. Mm. And it's a cracking guitar anyway because it's a, you know, these Gibsons. But the sign on it was like, could this be Elvis's guitar? Because it had a guitar stall on Oh, right. at the time oh, yeah. and it yeah. was there but it was I mean it's, it looks exactly like the one in Teddy Bear yeah. and that. Yeah. but it's funny because obviously especially at the parties now I always go ah, this, this is Elvis's guitar mm. you know and uh, it's funny because like then folk go and they put it on and they put Teddy Bear and they go it actually is and that, <laughs> kind of, especially if they didn't know much about guitars the guitars yeah. get made the same you know what I mean but I, I've been to Memphis it's a small place you know mm-hmm. it's uh, you go around the the city centre and things, you know, it's perfectly feasible. Uh, well, uh, I remember it was funny, John Gallagher, my friend, we had a flat together for years. Me, John plays, I think he plays in here sometimes. Yeah. But John's a good friend of mine, and we had a flat years ago and told him the story. And there was one night we had the flat, but we didn't have, uh, we didn't have any, any um, 
tables. Yeah. So I had one night, I'm sitting, I was sitting in the room and I had it because it's a big bodied thing. And mm-hmm. I had it like that and I had my Chinese meal. <laughs> and I'm sitting with the Chinese meal and the prong crackers and that. <laughs> and he come and he's like, he still goes on about the day, he goes, he's got Elvis played his guitar and he's eating a Chinese meal off Elvis played his guitar. Eh? I'm sure Elvis would have done the same. You know. <laughs> I it probably would have, would have been peanut butter sandwiches. Pe- pe- peanut butter sandwiches, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Mm. Aye. Aye. So uh, I was thinking maybe you could you could give us a song. Aye. Uh, yeah. Aye, if, uh, a song, um, have you figured out what you're going to Well, play? I mean, I, I'm thinking, um, I mean, do you, I could do an original one, just uh, a lot of folks, the one that folk asked me for, a lot I've noticed, uh, there's one called Whiskey, mm-hmm. and that was in the second album, but there was a cut, you know, sometimes it's nice, it's people come in, like I was playing there at night down the road there, and... Uh, that just a bunch of guys were in there watching and I, I didn't know them eh? and then somebody said you do whiskey and I was like oh wow can somebody ask for your own song mm. a lot of the songs I never play them live so I can't remember them mm. so folk will ask you for a song and you go I don't know it and they're like eh but you don't you never play your own stuff in the bars because in the bars folk are wanting the stuff that they know yeah sure but it's nice to do them but I'll do, I'll do the one whiskey for you I'll play that it's uh, quite a powerful song I mean it's, it's kind of says for itself just about like uh, you know, like somebody struggle with, with, with alcoholism, basically. Mm. And uh, again, it was Chris was great for if I was sometimes how I, I was maybe thinking about a subject, mm-hmm. and he could write on it, mm. which was and it was almost like he's a smart guy. You know, Chris, what I mean, he yeah. could write on. The, the, and when he sent me that one, I remember, I remember that particular song. He sent me that in an email. I was feeling particularly rough. And uh, I remember seeing it, uh, the lyrics, and I was like, that's amazing. And I honestly wrote the, no, I mean, it's a kind of basic tune, but I wrote that tune within uh, minutes. Mm. It was mental. I wrote it, and then I phoned him, and I was singing it on the, mm-hmm. the phone. So it's one of my favourite ones that we've done. And there's other ones that obviously don't work as well acoustic, but maybe we're a band. Mm. But uh, the one whiskey, it's a powerful wee song. So, um, I think let's hear whiskey ah, from Stevie Agnew. They talk about it. Okay. Tell me my love when you've been to the brink And I've taken the edge off my thirst When I'm falling from grace in the eye of the storm With the pain of remorse at its worst Tell me my love when you've been victimized Breathe through the horror again When the filth's washed away and you've scrutinized Tell me I'm still a good man Tell me my love Tell me my love Tell me my love When the sad song is sung And the gates of regret I throw away When the bed has been made And the wounds are still young the blood from the thorn in your side Tell me my love When your heart's held to ransom And the struggle forgot to begin When redemption is gone And I'm out of excuses And I'm scratching the door to come in Tell me my love 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 When you've been to the brink I've taken the edge off my thirst When I'm falling from grace In the eye of the storm With the pain of remorse At its worst Tell me my love when your heart's held to ransom 
And the struggle forgot to begin When redemption is gone And I'm out of excuses I'll be scratching your door to come in Tell me my love Tell me my love Tell me my love Tell me my love Outstanding, Stevie. Wonderful. Ah, boy. Thank you. Ah, it's a powerful wee tune. It certainly I is. I think, yeah. in a way, yeah. But it's, uh, aye, I like that one. The lyrics are, are so beautifully it's crafted. It's powerful, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's powerful. It's powerful. It's a kind of... So the, the melody for that just came to you as soon as ah, you read the lyrics? Well, I mean, I've kind of got a bit of bother myself with the old, uh, the old devil just... And, 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 and it kind of, at that time, it's been doing all right now, but back in the day, I remember feeling particularly brutal... And you know, as 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 loads, of, I think we're what of folk like that every Sunday. Eh? But uh, yeah. nowadays, I have a bro fry up doing it, doing the stair. Good. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we certainly want to keep you around as long as we can, Stevie, because uh, you're loved in this town, and uh, ah. I hope you come back and play well, for us again. Thanks, man. It was a pleasure. Okay. Good yeah. man. Thank Cheers, you, bro. Cheers, man. Yeah.